this is Sean. Um, I'm doing a little bit different video today. This is more a little bit of an education because I don't think many people understand the electrical grid. Um, I know I didn't initially until I got into the business. I mean, I'm, I'm a transmission system operator uh, for a major power utility, and I'll get more into that in a second. But in the picture that you see, the generation station is just that, the generation station. It's where they make the electricity that's in the red. Then you, of course, are the customer, and you're going to use it, right? Well, we got to get it from the generation to the end user, be it an industrial or a customer. Well, that is going to be the blue part of the graph. That's the transmission system, big high power voltage lines, real high power to get it from one point to the other. When you get into the green on the graph, that's the distribution. Now the distribution steps the voltage back down to something a lot more usable and then distributes it literally to all the end customers, both the industrial customers, residential customers, um, shopping centers, you know, back down to your own refrigerator. Okay, so that's a basic layout of the electrical grid. So there's three separate components. Now, one thing a lot of people don't really understand is that there has to be an exact balance between the generation and the load. It's not like a battery. It's not just out there and then when you need it, you tap off of it. There's a balancing that going on, balancing that going on between setting the generation and matching it to the load. And it's pretty intricate, and that's a lot more in-depth than you need, than you really need to know. But I just what I'm going to go for in this video is to give you a little bit of an explanation about the grid and why, you know, and I'm not downplaying green energy, but I want to give you some facts about green energy as far as it relates to the grid. It's great to put in your house, in neighborhood, in local applications, but a lot of people have a misnomer about the grid in general and how you know, solar and wind and all that can go toward the grid. Um, and I'm going to touch on that a little bit. But anyway, that's a beef overview of the grid. And now let's talk about a little bit more specifics. Okay, guys, as you can see, the, the grid's just enormous. The North American grid, and that's how it's kind of divvied up. It's not really by country. It's by the North American and their subdivisions within. And you can see those in, in you see WCC, you see MRO, NPC, um, RFC, those are the different reliability corporations to make sure that it's operated reliably to try to prevent major blackouts. Little ones happen, but you don't want, you know, back 2003, 2004 when the whole Northeast went black. That's a major, major issue that, that all the regulating organizations are going to try to prevent. But you can see, I mean, it's huge. The U.S. has 22% of the world's consumption of electricity. Um, there's over 3,000 electric utility companies, 17,000 power plants. Um, you got over 165,000 miles of high voltage lines. And high voltage is 100,000 watts and or 100,000 volts, excuse me, and above. Okay, so 100 kV and up is the definition of high voltage. There's tons of lower stuff, but you got, you know, 100,000, you have two over 230 lines you have 345 lines you have 500 kv lines 765 kv lines are starting to get in there new um so it, it, it it's it's a lot of stuff and that's just the really big stuff that's not the distribution and the sub sub transmission and the industrial and residential stuff okay so we've got over six million miles of distribution lines that's your lower voltages um you know 140 million meters over a trillion dollars in assets you know, over 350 billion in avenue revenues. And, and this is a little bit older uh, screenshot, the information that I got, but this is give you a background. You know, that's what's going on, just the grid, okay? Okay, guys, now the, um, the different transmission voltages, when you see the towers alongside the road, this is just a little uh, picture to kind of give you an idea. The really big tower in the far left, that's 500 kV, and that's, that's your big time, you know, able to transfer power long distances. Your next one down, 230 kV. They kind of skipped one. There's one in between 345. That's a, you know an extra high voltage line, extreme high voltage line that goes. But 230 kV. Then you have a 138 kV or 115 some places. Then you start getting into your sub transmission level, which is 69 kV. Then down into your distribution levels, which are 7 to 13,000 kV lines. And those are normally a lot of times wooden poles. Um, even the 69 a lot of times are even wooden poles. So. When, when you're driving down the road and you're looking at those, that's what those lines are. Um, now, 
just the concept of the power generation or distribution uh, I'm going to talk about next. Now, one question is, hey, why do we need all these big power lines anyway and all these different voltages and whatnot? Um, here's a little quick, you know, electrical theory thing about Ohm's law and power. Um, we s use AC because it's very easy to step up and step down voltages with transformers. Transformers have no moving parts. It's all electromagnetically done. And for the most part, they're inexpensive in compared to other ways of doing it as if it were DC. Now, they're still expensive components. Transformers are not easy to make. They're big units. They're heavy. They're costly and they're time consuming to manufacture. So we tend to take care of them as if they were our children on the, on the grid as far as the way we operate things. However, for the purpose of this discussion, I'll let you know what's going on. You use those really high voltages to reduce the current. If you reduce the current, you reduce the losses, normally of heat, and then as you're transferring it to get it from the generator to the customer. Now, if you look, the, the little Ohm's law is voltage equals current times resistance, and then power equals current squared times resistance. Okay, or power also equals current times voltage. So, power you can't change, just, you know, quick electrical theory here. So if you're generating power, raw form, from the generator, the customer is going to use it at the other end. But the process of getting it from the generator to the customer, if you make your voltage really, 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 really high, then your currents are very, very small. And the current is what robs your power in transmission from a transmission standpoint. So on those big lines, the higher your voltages are, the lower your currents are on the lines, the less your losses are. So the companies, your power companies, utilities generating, they, they don't, they're not losing money transmitting the power. So that's why you have all those different voltage classes. And the, the higher we can make the voltage safely and transmit it, the better it is for the grid because then we're getting the most power to the customer and not losing power just transmitted along the way. So that's why you have those really, really big um, lines and all these different high voltage classes. So they're like I said, 765 kV is going in throughout the country as well. 500 was and still is, I guess, our main backbone as far as the entire interconnection. But there are some 765 lines, and I think even in China they're they're doing like a 900 kV. So they're they're experimenting on getting up to literally, you know, into the million kV. You know, one you know 1,000 kV level. You know, so really really high voltage but the whole point of that is so that we can transmit the power from where the generators are to where the customers are to use that power so just wanted to go over that real quick now that's going to lead into why i wrote, did this whole video anyway sorry for the you know eight and eight or nine minutes of of some electrical theory and some background but i want you to to have an idea of what's going on um before i start making people angry <laughs> anyway this is you know the that's why we use the really high voltages anyway. Now, my job is I sit in a control room similar to the one here in the picture. Um, this is just one I found off the net because we're not allowed to take pictures of the control room. But you sit in front of a bunch of monitors and you monitor uh, voltages through, you know, throughout the system. You run um, basically simulations. Um, whenever you have to take lines out due to maintenance or if a tree falls on a line or a lightning strike or a car accident hits a pole it takes out a distribution voltage there's, there's a lot of things that go on for and how we get power from the generator to the end customer um, and, and that's part of what I do now what I said earlier about making people angry is here here's the basic makeup of the grid as far as just to give you a general 33 percent of our grid is generated from coal. 33% is natural gas. About 20% is nuclear. And then, then all your renewables combined are around like 13%. And yeah, you're missing a percent there just due to rounding errors. Now, of that 13%, 6% of that's hydro. You know, uh, run a river dams, pump storage facilities, all the different ways where we're using water. So if you get rid of dams and, and all that only seven percent is everything else wind solar biomass um, 
burning wood chips, burning, you know, uh, coal, uh, different industries that take their waste products, if they use wood, for example, the bark off the trees and that sort of thing. Well, a lot of them burn that to generate electricity to help run their plants or sell it back to the grid. But, I mean, everything else, absolutely everything else you can think of, fuel cells, hydrogen, any other thing you can think of that generates electricity is 7% of the rest of the grid. So, no matter what politician tells you anything else or what Greenpeace person, and, and guys, hey, we, we in the power industry, it's not that I don't like renewable energy. I would love it if we had a lot of it and it was reliable. But here, here's the thing. Like I said, it's 7% of the grid, and that's everything else. Wind and solar, you're looking, you know, like two and a half ish, give or take, and then, you know, maybe 4%. So you cannot get, you cannot run the grid. If you're going to try to run a grid with wind farms and solar panels, get your candles out, boys and girls, because that means you're not going to have power for about 90% of the day. You just, you just can't do it. You cannot get there from here. If it was free tomorrow, you can't get there from here. It's not, it has nothing to do with, with what any politician tells you. They're liars. So anytime you start hearing every talking head talk about, well, we're going to have 40% of our of our <laughs> uh, power generation due to renewables, they're lying. You cannot do it. It physically can't happen. No matter what law they pass, they are, they always got to turn around and, and extend it or push the deadline down or kick the can down the road. It's a lofty goal. I'm not saying we don't want it to happen. I'm just telling you, real world right now, 2016, you cannot get there from here. So, and again, I'm not knocking renewables. I'm just telling you, reality has to kick in sooner or later. No matter what you think, you can't do it. Technology and the world as it sits now. So, now let's tell you why some of that is true, especially from a reliability standpoint. Because that's what I deal with is it, I have to have reliable power. Wind isn't reliable because if the wind quits blowing, I don't have that power anymore so you can't rely on so many megawatts of power in an area due to wind because the wind can change and if you have a reduction in power that's just as if a gen that's the same thing to me as if a generator trips offline well, once that generator trips offline that causes issues on the grid your power doesn't flow the same way your your paths going from the generation to the load change your contingencies pop up where you're going to over overload lines and transformers because now the power has to flow a different way because you've changed the mix. It's a very, very, very complicated process. But let's let's just boil it down a little bit as to why solar and wind and those other things, one of the big reasons they don't really help. Well, wind can help you. Not what I'm about to say doesn't apply to wind because it does give you reactive resources. But like solar and those other renewables, there's no reactive resources for voltage support. They, they, there may be down the road, technology may catch up, but as it sits now, that doesn't exist. So let me tell you what I'm talking about as far as VAR support so that you can kind of understand what I'm talking about. Now, for when we talk about power, your total power is divided into basically two, well, two things. You have real power, which is megawatts, that actually does the work or kilowatts from lower ground. I deal in megawatts on my end, so we'll talk about in from with the mega um, prefix. So please just just think watts and and go big. That's what I'm talking about. So megawatts, that's what does real work. You know, that's what, you know, makes a, a uh, drives a motor, motor runs and you know, that's real power. Reactive power is what is necessary to generate electric is the power consumed by the electric fields like in a motor for example your 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 basic motor action or your generator action you have to have an electric field before you can generate torque for a motor or have electric electric motor force and all the things that it makes motors and generators work so you have real power which does work and reactive power which is essentially a support system to think of the easier way to explain it that I found at least what worked for me going through all the, the class and certification is uh, the top photograph at the top, you've got a ball on an incline. Really simple. Think of a giant ball. You know, you're back in the Flintstones and you got a big boulder. <laughs> you're trying to get the boulder from point one to point two on the incline. If you just push it at a 90 degree angle, that's going to roll down down the incline. Okay, so if it's just one person pushing, you know, you can't do it. Right, it fall off the cliff, roll off. So if you have help, so say two of you are pushing, and then you have one person that's 
pushing up to hold the ball up so you're moving in a straight line to get from point one to point two and it not rolling off the incline. The, pe the two people pushing from point one to point two, that's real power, that's your megawatts. The one person the one person that's holding the ball up, allowing the other two to stay, to keep it on the incline as it goes from point one to point two, that's your reactive power, all right? That's your, then, and that's your voltage support. And then your total power is the sum of the two, which would be the hypotenuse of the triangle. So for you, uh, you know, geom well, math, uh, excuse me, trigonometry people, you know, your three, four, five right triangle is is used in electrical power theory tremendously. So that's just that's the easiest way I have to to describe it is your real power that's doing the work that's moving it from point one to point two. Your reactive power, which allows the real power to be done, is your going is the guy that's holding the ball up as it's being point moved now all that said that's how that's a that's your volt when i talk voltage support i'm talking about vars megavars which is mvar which is volts amperes reactive that's the term for reactive power okay so our megavars you have to have that to help to give the oomph so the power can be pushed from the generators through the transmission line to the distribution and then into your house so you can use it and actually have your refrigerator run and your blender run and the, your oven get hot and your dryer work and all that kind of things. So that's where in a lot of the, the renewable energies fall short is in a reactive power. Solar power is glaringly the largest um, example of this. So from a grid perspective, it just doesn't help. It's not it's not the technology isn't at the level to where it's going to be good now for your house great put it on the side of your house and you know then it's just a cost ratio is it is it cheaper to buy the power off the grid or is it cheaper for you to put the solar panels up and supplement what you're using off the grid or if you're really not really cost concerned and you're just wanting to you know preserve renewable resource use renewable resources to preserve the fossil fuels and not have to use them as much that's great from a neighborhood perspective or an individual house perspective wind and solar and anything else you can come up with you know is great to use but from a national grid perspective again I'm talking national grid perspective it, it doesn't have the VAR support so therefore I can't use it it doesn't help me as a transmission system operator to get power from the generators to the distribution it I have to have reactive support or else you have voltage collapse. And voltage collapse is what caused the blackout back in the early 2000s. The big blackout that wiped out, you know, the whole Northeast, it was, you know, it was a domino effect of many things, but you ended up losing voltage support. Without that VAR support, the whole grid blacks out. You go black. So, and again, it's very, very complicated. So if you're not in the industry, please don't leave comments and go onto Wikipedia and pull stuff up and try to pull a, a rabbit out of a hat to try to prove me wrong I, I'm just I'm not even going to entertain I'm, I'm, I'll call you I'll probably call you a couple names I shouldn't call you and move on but it, the reality is we do not have the technology set up today and it's not feasibly producible cost wise to on a national level to where you can have a solar panel replace a coal, gen, a coal firing generator can't do it can't not get there from here and again, it's not that I don't want it. I would love for it to happen. And there is some technology that they're working on to get VAR support from solar, for example. Um, but the other thing about solar, too, is the is getting it so that it, the, the battery technologies is more re lacking. I mean, batteries have come a long way. You know, the little tiny lithium-ion batteries we have in our phones now are outstanding. You know, much better than the, the old NICAB batteries of days gone by. They're still they're a lot smaller and, and lighter than before, but still batteries are big and heavy as far as in the world of of you know electricity is concerned. And they have a limited capacity. As the battery technology gets better, maybe you know solar can be more to the forefront, and that would be an awesome thing. But so let's live in the real world for a minute. That doesn't mean we stop researching those other things and trying to get wind and solar and and like fuel cells, I'm a big fan of fuel cells. I would love to see that because that's a limitless source of power because all you need is water. You know, pure water, electrolysis, break down the hydrogen and oxygen and, and use the hydrogen. I mean, it's the most abundant 
in you know the most abundant element in the, in in the universe and it's very combustible so we, we could use hydrogen as a fuel very easily um you know there's other things that go into it infrastructure and that sort of stuff but i would like to see fuel cell technology go but again it's kind of linked to batteries too um so there's a lot of things out there but when you hear somebody talking about oh well we can replace the entire electrical grid with wind farms and solar panels uh, that person's an idiot he's an uninformed needs much much more education or they're just blatant liars, which is both bad. Neither of that's good. So that's that's the main crux I wanted to talk today. There there are many ways to do this, and I hope we can get there one day. Because like I said, it's 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 better for all of us. But don't think that it's going to happen in the next five years. You know, just you know, I don't know. Unless we find ET somewhere and he opens up some alien technology that we can use, and all of a sudden transform it, that'd be great. But the way we set right now, real world. It, you just cannot get there from here. So the the VAR, the mega VARs is your biggest stopping point from a grid perspective of renewables playing a bigger part in, in our in our national um, energy plan. Now, as I said before, um, our energy makeup has changed. This graph, shows you that we're using a lot more natural gas and less coal from compared to 2007 this was in 2013 those figures I gave you before was what I pulled up on the website here as of you know now October of 2016 um, so we're up from 27 percent in 13 to 33 percent in 2016 um, and natural gas is great we've got tons and tons and tons of it more than anyone I do believe um, now, from a, again, and I'm speaking from a national grid perspective, the drawback to natural gas is that your combustion turbines, your CTs that use natural gas, don't like to work in the wintertime. When it's really, really cold outside, there's a number of factors where that has issues as far as if you had your entire fleet, if your grid was using natural gas instead of coal, for example. Um, which we have the ability to do it. I mean, I believe supply lies we could do it. I don't know if the infrastructure is there to get it to where we needed to get it, but because that's not you know my my expertise. But the bag, the drawback to natural gas generation is it doesn't like to work when it's really cold. The OCTs many times can't come online when we need them to, and that causes problems. Um, the other thing, which and this might sound a little funky to you. The generators aren't the highest priority for the natural gas industry. Heating is the, is the biggest priority for the natural gas industry. So when you have those, like year before last, we had the polar vortex in the Northeast that caused, you know, from a transmission perspective, caused us a lot of problems. Well, one of those problems was the even the, the units that could come online, they were out of fuel. And you couldn't get them any more gas because they weren't on the high enough on the priority list to get it. So, yes, mom and pa Kittle's house needs to be heated, and heated takes priority over electrical generation from a natural gas perspective. So, when you're not as high up on the priority list as other things, then the generators, if they don't get the fuel piped into them, then they can't run. And that's pretty much how those generators, it's a pipeline type setup. Some of them, you know, have tankers and all that that bring it in that way. But it's no, normally a, a, like a pipeline thing. And then there's pumping stations along the way that, that think of it from a water perspective. It's like keeping your pressure up in your water main. Well, they have to keep the pressure up in the gas, excuse me, in the gas main to push that power to get that natural gas to where it needs to go. Um, well, Believe it or not, a lot of the electrical generators aren't high up on the, the priority list to get gas. Now, of course, if the majority of the of the of your generation was from natural gas, maybe all that would change. But as it sits now, and again, like I said, two years ago, that polar vortex caused us issues because we couldn't get, you know, some of the CTs couldn't come on. Not that they weren't able to come on, but they didn't have fuel. Now, what I was talking about, the just the mechanics of the way those combustion turbines work, um, the generation plants are, you know, were told us, hey, we'd love to come on. We've got fuel to come on, but, you know, the damn thing's frozen. I, they can't keep all the equipment up to get it running. So there is a problem with natural gas. It's not as just a cut-and-dry solution as many people might think. It is a great resource, and they're awesome. I, From my perspective, I love the CTs. 
because they're fast. They come online quickly. They can change quickly, load. They don't have a long what's called a ramp time. Um, your generators don't instantly change if you say, okay, I need 100 more megawatts out of you if it has that much capacity. You know, if you say, hey, I need you to generate 50 more megawatts, 100 more megawatts of power, even if it has the capacity to do so, getting there some, on some units takes a long time because you just don't, it's not flip a switch, you just don't turn the knob and now all of a sudden you go from 100 megawatts to 200 megawatts or 500 to 600 or 1,000 to 1,100, you know, because they, you know, depending on the size of the unit, but what's called a ramp rate takes into account that too. So from a transmission perspective, we love combustion turbines because they're normally a lot faster than a steam-driven unit. Um, so there, there's a lot of advantages to them. They're quick. They come online quicker than a steam unit. They're 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 fast reacting. You can you know changes in the grid can be can be absorbed, for so to speak, by the by the the CTs. But you know the the, the backbone of the of the entire electrical grid, like it or don't like it, Greenpeace, hate Greenpeace, love Greenpeace, um, green person, non-green person, is coal. Your big coal units, your steam units, they're the backbone of the entire grid. Nuclear is a huge portion of our grid. Not as big as other countries, like I believe France is like 75% of their power is nuclear, I believe. Um, and and, and they, they utilize the uranium much better over there. Um, they have three different levels of reactors, basically. So when the your top tier fuel is spent, they can reprocess that spent fuel because there's still tons of uranium in spent fuel. Um, they can reprocess and use it in their B grade reactor, and then when those need to be refueled, they can reprocess that waste product fuel into a third level reactor. And obviously, the B and the C are not anywhere near as efficient as the A level. But you know, nu the the France's nuclear industry is is very much the the bulk of their grid. Um, again, there's there's all different kinds of you know, a ton dozen ways to skin a cat. So I'm not saying one's better than the other, but I'm just saying as it sets now, the backbone of the grid is coal. Um, natural gas is is on equal footing as far as percentages as the latest figures that I pulled up as of 2016. Um, and they've made great strides. You saw the you saw the graph there, representation, you know, from 2007 2013. Um, and it'll be better. You know, they can make units better. They can change the priorities for the gas fuel lines so that the maybe the those turbines are are higher up on the priority list, so that they don't not have fuel to be able to come online when we need them to. And so there's just a it's a lot more complex than than just saying oh we're going to put some solar panels up and put some wind farms up so i just wanted people to understand because when i hear the the talking heads on tv and the pundits and the pro guys and the con guys and everyone spouting their position um i just makes me sometimes want to throw a brick through the tv because i just want to shout at them that they're just not living in the real world um so once technology gets better great when hopefully that day comes, I would welcome it with open arms. But right now, as it sits now, let's stop demonizing the non-green resources because you can't live without them. Our, our, we cannot survive. Our technology, our society would not exist as it is today without you know coal and petroleum-based stuff. You just that that is a fact. It is not a it's not bad or good or indifferent. It's just how it is. So as the technology gets better, wind and solar will be more. Other renewable, uh, renewable resources will be will be a bigger player on the national stage. And again, we will welcome that with open arms. But as it sits right now, that's the deal with the electrical grid. So unless you want to go back to you know, jumping on a bike and having a pedal to, to run your TV, then setting, you know, burning candles and doing a lot of things independently, that's the alternative. So when anyone talks about that, you know, oh, well, we can do everything with wind and solar, they're idiots, don't listen to them. They have absolutely zero foot in reality in, you know, some Star Trek fantasy in, you know, the year 2099 maybe, but as it sets right now, can't be done. So definitely push for better research better um, technology advances so that maybe all those things can happen um, 
But in the meantime, let's not cut our nose off the spider face. That doesn't mean we don't strive to be better and strive to have a better grid. I'm just telling you the way it sits now, this is what we got. So thanks for listening. Didn't want it to be too awful long, but I also wanted it to be real and let's give you guys an explanation on on real world way things set. Hope you like it. Leave your comments, questions in the bottom. And again, this is not my normal run for my normal channel, but I just wanted to make this for a while now. So hope this helps give you a little bit better understanding from a grassroots, real, real level explanation that from a guy that doesn't have a dog in a fight from I need to make money from wind or I need to make money from coal or I need to make money, you know, those talking point guys. Um, again, if you have any questions, I'll do my best to answer them and, and understand there's, it's a lot more complex than what you think. It's, it's, it's not as, as easy as, you know, plug in your plug in the wall and you get power. It's not a battery. There's a big balancing act going on for you to get electricity and keep it. Um, so again, thanks a lot for listening and have a good day.